Welcome and welcome back to our 2024 Terror Researchers and HA Researchers series with our, with our beloved Dr. Jan MacArthur to kick us off to a fantastic year. I'll introduce Jan to you uh, properly in just one moment. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself first, uh, my co-host, and um, the series in a little bit more detail um, because we have some uh, new faces who have joined us today. So once again, welcome and welcome back to our regular uh, friends. Um, so um, I'm Puyin, I am a PhD candidate with the um, Education Research Department at Lancaster University. I'm also the Innovation Scholarship Manager at Queen Mary University of London. So John, would you like to say a few things? Hello, my name's John Brindle. I'm also a PhD candidate at Lancaster University on the eResearch and Tell programme. Uh, just started my data collection yesterday, so I'm very excited. Um, and I'm also a learning design manager at Hedge, Edge Hill University um, in sunny Ormskirk. Thank you, John. Um, so um, for those of you who have joined us before, uh, you might have noticed which seems to change the name again, and you are correct. Uh, I think reflecting on how we've extended our invitation since the middle of last year to not just tell researchers, um, but researchers who work in HICCHI, often in more kind of uh, multidisciplinary context, uh, it, it's including HG researcher hashtag is more appropriate. So I guess we're now officially called tell researchers and HG researchers. Uh, you see from our promotional materials, the two hashtags, we do use them sort of interchangeably in different places, uh, depending on which discipline, if you like, um, the speakers associate themselves with more. That's not to say they only work in one particular discipline, but for branding reason, we need something short and catchy rather than a thesis um, as our brand. Um, so um, just to explain the series in a little bit more detail. So the series is really about the stories of some of the established researchers, the, the legends, if you like, the amazing stars in the world of education research, people who we look up to, people who we admire from afar, or in my case, sometimes once or twice down the corridor um, in Lancaster, I have done it before to just to stock this um, amazing people, uh, people who we really want to have a conversation with and ask them questions like, how did you do it? How have you managed? So this is basically the rationale of the series. So it's not about particular research output or a paper or a PhD application. We're not here to find your PhD, your PhD supervisor, although it has happened off of the back of the, the series. Um, it is really about our speakers reflecting on their career to date, the things they are most proud of, uh, career milestones, things that they wish they could have done differently or could have done more, people who have inspired them along the way. So it's really about the researchers themselves, the people, not the research. Okay, now then, on to the main event. Um, it is a true honour for me to introduce Dr. Jan MacArthur, who is the head of the Education Research Department at Lancaster University, where she also works as a senior lecturer in education and social justice. Um, now, Jan is known for many things in the world of educational research, but perhaps some of the things that come to mind when her name is mentioned immediately are things like authentic assessment, why did grades even matter, carings and belongings um, in education. And I think it's fair to say that these things all come from a fundamental belief that social justice really matters in this world, caring for our students, treating them as individuals, not just bombs and sit and statistics should be given in every single one of our role, no matter what we do in education. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand the stage over to Jan and to, to talk about her truly established um, career. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and it's really nice to see you all. So I've called this How on Earth Did I Become Dr Jan MacArthur. Um, it's the worst thing about an established academic is if they start talking about themselves in the third person then you really know that they're a pretentious twit who needs to be taken down a few pegs and I won't name the famous educational philosopher who does this a lot but I suppose I was just thinking that you probably think sometimes I think people look at my career stage and feel that it's unattainable but you know that's where I was once and I don't know how I got here. I also thought I should warn you that there are two Jan MacArthur's that's my cousin she lives in England so be careful when you're out and about there are, there are two of us. So here's where I'm going to start. Um, 
I grew up, I'm Australian, long hot summers, too hot to always be outside. So a lot of time just inside watching the cricket in summer, mainly Australia beating England, obviously. But what I did one summer is on the old typewriter that we had, I learned to type. I learned to type the old fashioned way with elastic band on an old piece of book covering the keys. And I learned to type. And why I'm saying that, one of the best things that's ever equipped me for being an academic is being a really good typist. The amount of time it saves. So it's not too late, folks. If you want to make life easy, uh, probably wouldn't do it on an old Underwood, but I did. So then I'm going to bounce forward. There's going to be a lot of bouncing forward in my talk and there's going to be a lot of sharing of books. So I want to bounce forward to, to my school years, to at high school. And I was, obviously Australia has changed a lot since my childhood and changed a lot in its relationship to Indigenous people and understanding of the land of Australia. But I was lucky enough that in my final year at school studying Australian history, we studied Aboriginal pre-culture and also the European so-called settlement invasion. And this book was just a, a life changing book for me. And it was really a life changing book for Australia in terms of our history and our understanding of justice. And what Henry Reynolds did because it, it, it had always been argued that Aboriginal Australians just lay down, that they were so weak and useless that they just lay down and let the Europeans take their land. And what Reynolds did through very careful research is show that that wasn't true. If you looked at the frontier from the other side, it looked different. And I just, that lesson has stayed with me forever, that looking at it from the other side and how different it could look, but also just that this book, this book written by an academic has changed lives, has helped some people out of poverty. There's still too many children, Aboriginal children, die in Australia, but there's fewer than there were before this sort of scholarship. And the other thing is this fabulous last chapter, which is really important to how we think about social justice issues. And he says, people just say, but it's a long time ago. Just forget it. It's too long ago. We can't do anything now. And he says the irony of that in a country where every single country town has a memorial that says, lest we forget, you can't go to the tiniest country town in Australia and not see lest we forget. And Henry Reynolds pointed out that irony. So I suppose you're seeing here the root of my commitment to social justice. And this was all thanks to a teacher called Mr. Terry Hastings. And I wish I could find him in the world to tell him where I am now. At this time, I was also introduced to this painting, which is again about perspective. This is one of the first, this is the first European who went to Australia and tried to paint the landscape. So his techniques are all based on European trees. And you can see here, there's a, there's a weird sense of this picture, isn't there? It's sort of beautiful and you sort of can tell what it is, but it sort of doesn't look quite right, doesn't look quite real. And yet, of course, it is very real. It's a very real sense of this man trying to come to terms with this alien landscape. But then also we see the Aboriginal people, they're looking peaceful. And we know actually at the time of this painting was one of the most horrific episodes of genocidal violence in the world. And then we go back to, to lest we forget. So I'm staying on this theme. Then the next big influence that shaped me as an academic was this book, Xavier Herbert. And again, it was one of the first where there was literature that was about Aboriginal people and their lives, and it was written in a genuine way. Probably it's a bit dated today, but I want to mention it because I'm going to talk about two intractable social justice issues. This author, who was this sort of little man, he was on Parkinson, Michael Parkinson's show. And Parky said to him, oh, well, you know, what would you do if you could change anything to make life better for Aboriginal Australians? And Xavier Herbert said, well, I'd get all the Europeans out. I'd get them to all go back, leave it. And then Parky did a little Parky laugh and said, oh, well, that's not very realistic, is it? And Xavier Herbert said, but you said if I could do anything. And I think this is one of the things that social justice researchers face this idea that we're trapped by idealism and yet we're told we're not practical and 
it just I just always remember that Parky laugh. And and he's a nice guy, Michael Parkinson. But it showed at the time this uncomfortable uncomfortableness with facing these intractable social justice issues. And then they have this book by Graham Greene, A Burnt Out Case. I'm nearly through the literature section, everyone. But this book is about a leper colony. And one of the things that it's, it's Graham Greene writes beautifully. But there's a part in it where they're talking about the fact that a cure has been found. There's a treatment for leprosy. And at the time, lepers are being cared for in this community run by nuns. And one of the nuns says, just without meaning anything bad by it, oh, what a terrible shame. There'll be no one left to look after. So again, I'm just putting that out. It's the sort of issues we face when we research social justice. Oh my goodness, we might solve the problem. And over here, well, of course we can't solve the problem. So let me fast forward from my school days to university. So I went to Monash University um, in Melbourne and I studied economics and politics in, in a faculty that came out of the 1970s. So it was an economics and politics faculty. Um, it's gone now because the politics people decided they wanted to spend their time talking to other civilised people. So they wanted to go to the right side of the building where the arts people were. When they got there, they weren't very happy because then they found they weren't the only civilised people. It was much better being in the left where they could go around and say, we, we read Nietzsche, whereas, you know, and talk to the accountants and stuff like that. But it was a really great education. And it makes me very sad because I was one of the last generation to study economics as a diverse, exciting, colourful discipline um, but before the monetarists took over. So in terms of my formative um, intellectual influences, there is, of course, Marx, because we're studying economics. But also I want to stress, I was taught microeconomics, the whole theory of supply and demand by a Marxist. You can do that. We have that intellectual ability to hold certain views and yet understand the views of others. And that was so, was so wonderful about the faculty I was in at the time. Another great influence I was introduced to was E.P. Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class. This is a book of the most intimate detail of what life was like. And I use it as a as an idea of the different forms of social justice research we need. And I was also introduced at this time to E.P. Thompson's sort of slightly unusual book, The Poverty of Theory, which is a viscerating critique of Althusser which is interesting. And at the time I bought into, because I was told, oh, you know, read this. This is great. All of this theory stuff is nonsense. So you, some of you who know me will realise this is a bit odd. And I'm now supervising someone who is looking to resurrect Althusser. And I'm so with him on this task. Other big influence, Plato at this time. I did a module on Plato and Aristotle. And I loved that close reading of text. And then, of course, Habermas. At the time I was at university, Habermas ruled the world. He was the great intellectual thinker. He was the he was the progressive. It was all about critical theory, and critical theory was all about Habermas. And thank goodness, so I also read at the time this book, which hasn't dated, the Dialectical Imagination, which was Martin Jay's oops Martin Jay's PhD thesis. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh, I could never write a PhD thesis like that. I mean, I probably still couldn't because this is a fabulous book and I didn't write it. But thank goodness I did know that there were other critical theorists before Habermas. It was at the back of my mind, ready for its moment later in life. I then worked for a brief time in the public service, like the civil service. So I made debriefing papers for the Premier and stuff like that. And it was quite interesting. I did the whole power dressing thing in the 80s, the big earrings, the high heels. Um, and then I left it all behind. So there's some big gaps in my story, which I'm not going to fill in. But I left it all behind um, and moved to Edinburgh. And actually that top left window there, that was my flat overlooking St Giles Cathedral. And I went to Edinburgh because I was going to be a great novelist. That's why Hilary Mantel is here. I didn't know of Hilary Mantel at the time, but if I was to be a great novelist, I'd love to be her. And of course, I'm not, and I wasn't, and I won't be. But that's what I did. I moved here, 
And so I just wanted part time work uh, because I was writing my great novel and I was going to be a brilliant novelist. Um, I got some very classy rejections, but that's as close as I got. So during this time, I took up a part time job in the student employment service at the University of Edinburgh. The first, I want to tell you on the first day of induction, I worked as an academic at Monash, by the way. I came to this, I was clearly in a clerical role because I was just doing a little small role. I went to induction, I was talking to a very nice man over the cup of coffee and all of that. And then suddenly they said, right, academic staff through that door, everyone else through that. That's what that's what academic life can be like for some people. And I remember that moment and I remember how belittled I felt by being told I was that door and not that door. And so this is one of my commitments in higher education to stop that. I know there are some of you who who suffer from that. And so I just want to say I was there. So I started my British university career on the very bottom grade you could be at. Um, so yeah, so that was a long time ago. And then fortunately, this person, now some of you, hopefully some of you know who this is. This is Jeff Haywood, one of the pioneers about um, online learning. He gave me a job as a research assistant um, and then there's this chap. Now, I know some of you know him. This is Hamish McLeod. While I was just doing the dog's body work, Hamish sort of heard me talking and said, Jen, I think you could do more. Would you like to try doing some of the research? Now, if it was anyone else, you would think this is an older academic offloading work onto the then young Jan. But it wasn't. This was Hamish. This was a genuine, um, uh, uh, generous offer to help to, to, to bring me in. And so I had that. I started to do a bit of the data collection and learn the ropes of how it all worked. Then I met this man, Di Hounsel, who is Mr. Feedback. He's the person, if you now read, you can read billions of articles about assessment and feedback. Di Hounsel was the first person to say, you know what, feedback might be really part of what we think about assessment. And of course, he did this while working at Lancaster University in our department. But I met him at Edinburgh and then I also met his wife, Jenny Hounsell, and the two of them together were the people that made me see that assessment wasn't just that awful bit at the end. Because before that, I was a true academic, only interested in ideas. And this dirty business of assessing students was something we really didn't want to talk about. They changed my perspective and made me understand this sense of assessment potentially, not in practice a lot of time, but potentially as this incredibly positive driver of student learning. Then Ray Land, Mr. Threshold Concepts. I was in the room next door to Ray Land when he came up with Threshold Concepts. That is my claim to fame. I might just stop here because it doesn't get better than that. But Ray Land, cohort one of the Educational Research Department's original PhD program cohort one. Ronnie Bamba, cohort six, a real act of academic generosity. I knew Ronnie professionally. When I signed up for the Lancaster program, she said, oh, come, come and see me, Jen, come out to Harriet Watt. And I got there and she had a CD-ROM of all her coursework and her thesis. And she said, look, this might be helpful, Jan. Do with it what you want. There was no pressures. Oh, I'm not going to show you my work. It was, I had a brilliant experience, Jan. How can I help you have a brilliant experience? And I hope that's how we continue to, to act between cohorts. And then finally, Mark Huxham, who I've co-authored with, who um, I met at Napier University. And just Mark reminds me of that commitment to the joys of academic life. I talked at a conference last year and Mark was there. We got talking, we started having coffee. We skipped a session and by the end of it, we'd written half a journal article. Of course, it's still written, mainly half written now. But, you know, that intellectual buzz, that keeping it going, that remembering to find those spaces, to every so often have that conversation that's just about ideas running wild, but running wild for the purpose of how can we make the world better in our own little ways. So that's my pre-Lancaster background. I hope there was something of interest there. I don't know, um, but it might help you understand me a little bit more. When I came to Lancaster, all those green buildings weren't there. That's the thing to understand about my Lancaster experience. We started nearly 20 years ago 
and it was just all about tearing down buildings and building new ones. But I began at Lancaster and my first day and it was so exciting and it was the most exhilarating thing in my life to that point, apart from my children, obviously, I have to say that. And I did fairly well in the little small assignments that we had to do. But then we had on the my program three big ones. And so the first one I was about education and work. So I had no idea what to write on. So I thought I'll compare how nurse and le law lecturers talk about teaching and learning. I didn't have any particular interest in this, but I knew that what I had to do is I had to get data because data is what research is, isn't it? So I had to find a reason to get data. So that's what I did. And I wrote it up and you know the Lancaster system, you get all that fabulous prelim feedback. It was utter rubbish but I got lots of help. I produced something that was utter rubbisher, worse. I got lots of help. Then I got one more chance. Well, no, there were more chances in my day. So resubmission, absolutely, completely, even worse than the first could have imagined. And why did I keep getting worse? Because I had no idea what I was doing. I just thought, oh, well, this is research, I get data, I write it up, and then something happens. And if I'm lucky, I'll pass. So at this point, there was a lot of other stuff happening in my life, and I was in a pretty nasty work environment. So I just took time out. And that was the best thing I did. And those of you who are studying and think about intercalation, it's a positive thing. It's a positive thing always. So that was me. In the history of all doctoral students, I'm the only one who progressively got worse and worse the more great, great feedback I got. That I just didn't understand what I was doing. So then um, one Saturday, I went to a symposium at Edinburgh University. I wasn't working there by this time. And there were all the greats there. Paul Trowler was there, Paul Trigwell, other people you, you may or may not know. And it was about university and its disciplines. And at the end, Carolyn said, I'm going to put together a book proposal. And we're going to have main chapters from the keynotes. And then we want two responses from other people. And she came up to, and I was excited and think, oh, I could do something here. And she came up and said, Jan, are you going to put in a chapter proposal? And I just pointed out, I said, look, Carolyn, it's the great and the good here. Why would you want one from me? And she said, Jan, I'm really sick of the great and the good, and I'd love to hear something fresh. So with that encouragement, I got a chapter, well, actually a chapter and a half, sorry, in her book. But before I got there, I had her editorial. That's just an example out in the back. When I sent her my first draft, which I worked on so hard and was pretty good, she, she just would... It was like prelim feedback in overload. And I had a choice at that moment. My husband looked at it and said, that's disgusting. She shouldn't be so critical of you. So I had a choice. I could be affronted or I could decide to learn from it. And luckily, I decided to learn from it. And so it produced pretty good chapters. I think this was the test of time. And it meant then that I came back to Lancaster and I suddenly had, a, and I'd not suddenly, I had through through the kindness of her putting trust in me and encouragement and the kindness of the Lancaster people, I was starting to understand what this thing called doctoral research was about. And so I had an assignment to write. Um, and then I had a dilemma because I've been working on this stuff about university and its disciplines, but I'd started reading critical pedagogy and the critical critical pedagogy people are really against disciplines as they see them as sort of restrictive structures. And I thought, oh, no, I've misunderstood everything I'm reading, because if I was clever at all, I wouldn't like that literature and I wouldn't like that literature. Clever people know you can't like both. And then I thought to myself, well, what if I did like both? What if I do? And what if that's what I've got to write about? So bang, for the first time in my life, an original contribution to knowledge. That's what we're all aspiring to. But I'm going to just at this point, and this was a really big moment for me, realising what the task of writing was. 
but I do want to warn you, I'll just leave you to think about why I put this up there. I'm not a big believer in that idea of looking for a gap in the literature. And maybe we'll come back to Sharknado and you can understand why. But that was my big moment, folks. It took a long time to get there. It took four years and a lot of absolute rubbish work to get there. But I did get there. So then um, this is the article I wrote. Um, got published at the time in the Gold Standard Journal. So that was my ambition. So now I got really excited. I went to overdrive. And I'm going to publish this through this thesis. And I just wanted to share just to show how long success takes in higher education. So that's 2010, and it's only just got 100 citations. I mean, it's bloody hard work for what you get. But I also want to say, don't put it, don't don't dismiss articles that are 14 years old, because you know some of them are okay. So then I had to come up with another idea, which by now though I was in the swing of it. So this was the module that I originally failed. And I came back and I wrote this paper because this is something I wanted to talk about, that it's wrong to say, oh, wait, higher education should be social or it should be for economic purposes. It's both, and especially from a critical pedagogy perspective. So I wrote this. I should tell you, by the way, this one here, after my previous attempt got failed three times, this one was passed um, on the prelim stage. So like I really went rags to riches and it's just showing that this is this is what happens. It's the way of academic life sometimes. So I wrote this one and this is still my most cited journal article. And look down here at the bottom. I, this is probably a bit silly. I wouldn't write it this way now. Uh, thank you also to the three anonymous reviewers, included the one who really didn't like this paper and worked hard to change it. One thing I'm sure we can agree on is the value of such disagreement to academic life. So I had three reviewers. Two of them loved it, loved it, every word of it. The third hated it and said I was a bitter old professor just venting. The editor then, then I got sent back for reviews. Then the other two reviewers saw what the first one had said. Oh, hang on, no, maybe, we're, maybe he's right. Oh, yes, 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 maybe this needs more thinking. And I thought... You liked it the first time. So I had to rethink it for them as well. And I had to still keep rethinking it for him. And I think it went back about four or five times. And, you know, I learned a lot because they were right. My language was too aggressive in making my point. But I also, there was, a, there was decisions to be made about which battles I had with the editor. What I said, yeah, okay, I'll compromise and what wasn't compromisable. And that's how this paper got out. And I'm proud of it now. As I said, it's my most cited journal article. Then I had to come up with a third one. And I emailed my, so I'm on a roll now, aren't I? So I emailed my idea to the next tutor, which was Paul Trowler. And I got an email back saying, oh no, oh no, email back saying, frankly, I think that idea is quite boring. <laughs> You've got to give it to Lancaster. We can give direct feedback if we want. So I had to go away, you know, it was clear that I couldn't just be smug, rest on my laurels. This was still hard work. But that then produced this article, which again is still well cited. All three were on critical pedagogy in different versions. What I hadn't noticed was something about them, which I'll come to in a minute. So, oh yeah, and I just want to say, if this is, this is my current Google Scholar thing, all four of those, that's from the doctoral program in educational research. That's how much it changed my life. You should ask, how am I the researcher I am today? It's the doctoral program. It really is. So then to the gestation of a thesis. So I wanted to critique learning outcomes, predetermined learning outcomes. Ah, bah, humbug. They're rotten. We must get rid of them. Um, that led me to start all this reading on critical pedagogy. Then reading on critical pedagogy got me to read about critical theory, because for those of you who don't know, critical pedagogy is, is about form, understanding education informed by critical theory. So I start reading critical theory and then I discovered him. I, for some reason, because my idea was that I was going to look at all these current critical pedagogues and I was going to trace back all their different influences, which was a stupid idea. But anyway, but it got me to this. For some reason, reading Adorno worked for me. 
It doesn't for everyone, and he has many flaws, I'm happy to admit, but I also think he remains a philosopher and thinker with a lot to tell us. And the dialectic of enlightenment, how our trying to dominate nature was going to destroy human beings. I think it's got some relevance today. So I went from, so talking to my supervisor, Paul Ashwin, he only supervises the best, doesn't he, Puyin? No, all of our supervisors are great, as are all of our students. But so Paul sort of encouraged me to, well, why don't you focus on Adorno? Bring him to looking and I started to think about the nature of knowledge in HE. And then, what? I don't know what I'm doing. Then I was in an email discussion. This is this was all still sort of thinking about it with Paul Trowler again. And he said, Jen, that sounds like you're writing a conceptual thesis. I don't know you very well, but that would be highly unusual. And I thought, oh, so that's what I'm doing. And then I realised, of course, my three articles are all conceptual. I didn't write them to be conceptual. I just wrote what I had to write, what I wanted to write. So then I remember, oh, sorry, I keep going. On. Then I remembered this, American politics in my second year as an undergraduate. And I wrote an essay on rebellion or revolution. What's the difference between rebellion and revolution? And I got a really good mark. And in the comments, the tutor said, Jan, you have a rare relish for conception. And in my mind, I had Paul Trailer at that moment, and I had well over 20 years ago, someone writing, you have a rare relish for conception. And I thought, oh, so I do. I actually really do like that working with ideas. I do like taking concepts and playing with them. And that gave me the confidence to then go forward to my thesis and just quite directly do it as the thesis I wanted to write. And I didn't worry whether it was called conceptual or empirical. It didn't matter. I was pursuing an idea that I thought was worth pursuing. So that then led to the where we're all hoping to go. And you will get there one day, folks. And when you do, you will please make sure you get your thesis bound, even though you're not required to. And then you'll find that you want to cuddle it and hold it close. And, you know, yeah. So I'm immensely proud of this, but I am so grateful to this department. I can't tell you. So and then all of that I did without data. All that data that in my first assignment, I knew that was the, that was how you did academic research. You got some data. Turns out that's not true. And so even though my work looks slightly unusual, like here's Henrietta, she's an odd looking bird. And so apparently my thesis was an odd looking bird, but you know what, it was okay. So that then led to my first book, which is largely my thesis. And here's my first question I want you to think about. Which comes first, the thesis or the book? Because this is really important if you're currently writing your thesis and you want to write a book. So I'm looking at the time. Um, so then I had, there was a conference at Lancaster, a great conference. I'd encourage anybody who's working in the field of higher education to think about going to the, the HECU, the Higher Education Close-Up Conferences. And there were think pieces that you had to respond to. And so I just came up with something I wanted to write. And I came up with probably the best title I've ever written, Virtuous Mess and Wicked Clarity, Struggle in Higher Education Research. And I love this article, and I think it stood the test of time. But look, it's only had a 1,000 views in all these years. It's actually got quite a lot of citations. So people who viewed it tended to use it. Why, no, why so few citations? Because back in that day, I was still so naive that keywords were just the annoying things that you were told you had to add. I didn't think what purpose they had. They just were annoying. So I'd just throw some keywords down to get rid of these people. Now I know that that's not true. This is how people find your work. Really spend time on these. As the editor of a journal, this is what I advise people all the time. Look at your keywords. No one will find you. With someone who wanted to search for clarity, really looking for an academic piece on Adorno and social justice? Probably not. It's a waste of a keyword. That's why I have so few views. Then the 1st of December 2013, I attended an interview 
for a job as lecturer in education and social justice at Lancaster University. And in my presentation of my plans for research, I said I was going to research assessment for social justice. It was a concept I'd invented. Why had I invented it? Well, I was working on assessment. This was about social justice. I was mainly an HE researcher, but I was going for a social justice role. I looked at the Lancaster people and there's a lot of HE teaching and learning, but no one on assessment. So I thought, All right, OK, well, there is a gap. This is this is where gaps work. So really, on the 1st of December 2013, I introduced the idea of assessment for social justice. And so then they look at that. It's a fabulous term, isn't it? Play on words of assessment for learning. I was as smug as a cat. I knew I was going to rule the world because I'd got this great concept, assessment for social justice. This is Daisy lying back because she knows she's got it all. Well, you know, <laughs> an idea is a lot more than four words. And so I, I did have a good idea, but I actually didn't know what it was. It took a lot of thinking through. So again, I got the term. It took me ages to write this first article, um, ages and ages and ages. But it was, in a sense, me sort of putting a flag in the ground for this concept. But it hasn't turned out to be the concept everyone talks about. I am proud to say that since this article, the idea of assessment and social justice is much more widely talked about. And I think I've had some small influence on that. But the idea that I was just going to rule the research world by having this great phrase, assessment for social justice, that was naive. I then thought, of course, we'll I have to write a book on it. Again, I didn't quite know what I wanted to write in my book, but I knew I had to write a book because books are what you write, isn't it? So what I, if I did it today, I would develop those ideas differently. I would have spent more time on journal articles first, developing different aspects and then going to a book. So which comes first, the book or the fame? I was chasing fame with my book and I should have been looking at the book. Meanwhile, quickly, I never gave up on Adorno and Horkheimer, was writing bits and pieces on them. And then uh, about eight years ago, Paul Ashwin invited me to be part of the Centre for Global Higher Education. And we did two projects, really longitudinal projects over eight years, following undergraduates through in England, South Africa and the US. And it was the most beautiful collaboration. And I've, I, it's a contrast to the Jan who can sit in her office alone with all her Adorno books and write something and write something maybe that's okay. And I love it. And this was the Jan where I was part of a research group, working with others, exchanging ideas and doing empirical research. So then I wrote something about critical theory and decolonial age. Then this is where we get to it. I had lots of invitations to talk about assessment. And then one Friday afternoon, my husband was away, so I was sitting on my own and I thought, I want to capture that. It was, again, I suppose, that idea of that flag in the ground. And so I decided I was going to write about authentic assessment because I'd been going around saying to everyone, you're all talking about it the wrong way. You've got it all wrong, all this world, real world rubbish. And I deliberately decided to target higher education because it was the best journal in the field. And so it was like an Everest for me. And I also wrote directly to that journal. I looked at how it had discussed these issues. And it took about four weeks to get a credible draft. It was so fast. And it was so different to comparing how nursing and law lecturers talk about teaching and learning. The difference was I had something to say. I genuinely had something to say. And that made the writing easier. And so that's gone on. It's been quite a big journal article, um, lots of views, lots of citations still get lots of invites. And so now I'm thinking, of course, I have to write a book on it. Well, we'll see about that. So I'm going to say goodbye from Henrietta, Gappy, Lucky. No, that's Betty, a toad, that, a toad that lives in our garden, and Daisy being absolutely shameless, but with a tummy like that, why not? And then I'll leave you this, which came first, the good idea or the book? That was it. that was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, which come first, the cat or the chicken? That was that's my first question. I've had I've had cats since I was four years old. 
For the cats. Yeah, not this particular cat, but, yeah, cats always. Cats in general. I've got a question for you, Dan, talking about your professional life. Well, what did it feel like when you, because obviously you did your doctoral study at Lancaster and you went back to teach there. What did, how did it feel like when you first started working there? It must have been quite strange, right? It was really strange because I knew half the department really well, or roughly half the department. So I knew them really well. But the people I was going to work with, most of them were new. So, yeah, so it was half familiar and half not. And I would walk down the corridor and sort of feel like I belong, but then I was just the newbie to other people. But for me, it was it was such a dream come true. When the job was advertised, I was on a mission. Night and day, I was preparing for that job because I just that was my job. Um, and there was all sorts of hurdles and difficulties because I still live in Scotland. Um, but I asked my boys who were young, would you mind if mummy was at Lancaster some of the week? And they said, we'll make you happy, mummy. And I said, yes. And they said, well, that's what you have to do, you know, because they'd seen me work in an unhappy place. I made a promise to myself a long time ago to only work with nice people doing interesting things. So getting the job for me was just that coming true. I mean, honestly, I know it sounds a bit saccharine, but I can't I can't say it any other way. That, that's really that's really amazing um, because um, as, as Jan and I, I'm going to make it probably had a quick <laughs> banter online. I said in about three years time, send me a spot. So I, I'm just going to get the <laughs> Um, we've got, um, Sue's got her hand up, so would you like to come to the mic? And... Thank you. Um, it, it's a thank you actually to, to Jan for sharing that story. And it makes me quite emotional because I've had a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, started the educational research PhD at Lancaster in during COVID. And yeah, it was it's been a, a difficult journey, but also a learning journey. And I can't tell you how much you and Anne Marie have made a difference to not just me, but to the, to the cohort. So I just want to say thank you so, so much because I'm still going. I integrated, but I'm back and hopefully, yeah, can keep keep going. I think I can I can certainly um, relate to Sue. I mean, last year I had a really tough year, but I refused to take time off. That that's just me being stubborn. That's got nothing to do with you know, and it's because of my supervisor Paul and Jan and everyone. It's just the supportive kind of environment. That that is something that I didn't think it would be for for a PhD study because we've heard horrible stories about how PhD students get treated like shit. That is absolutely not the case with the department. And this is why, partly the reason why this series is still going strong, because of the support from everyone from the department. John, you, you normally have a few questions to ask. It's your critical theory. Go on. You know you want to. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just blown away. So I'm, <clears throat> it's really good. It's really nice to hear your story, Jan, because I have only I think I've met you in person once <laughs> and chatted to you once. And my thesis changed totally after that, actually. But it's fine. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it was... <laughs> No, it was just really interesting to see the, I've actually written down a lot of book titles from that talk now of, of things that I want to pursue once I've got my thesis out of the way um, and done. Um, but I, I really like, um, uh, I, I suppose that, that having something to say thing was, is the biggest takeaway for me because I, I think sometimes you worry I don't know, but how do, you, how do you get over that worry that what you want to say isn't necessarily what people, yeah, you know, what people would be interested in? And I, I sometimes find that as a worry. Do you, do you ever, do you ever have that as a in the back of your mind? Sometimes are you thinking, I, I really think this is important, but I don't think anybody else is going to think it's important. Um, I do a bit, but I think what I learned, I might, I'm not in mute. I think what I learned was that. You can't be a people pleaser as a researcher making an original contribution because then you just never will. You'll just always be stuck in the present. And it is, you know, Adorno tells us we have to step outside sometimes to be able to, to see the change that needs to happen. It is about a little bit of self-confidence and self-belief and you find it one way or another. 
you know, I found it through a few people who had a bit of faith in me, encouraged me. As I said, I had that moment when Carolyn Craver gave me feedback of going down the route of being totally offended um, or taking it, taking it on the chin and, and doing it. So that was a really important moment for me. You know, you have to know that not all your ideas will be good. You know, <laughs> you might not have Paul Trailer say, frankly, that bores me. But, you know, some of them won't be good and you have to not you have to pick your fights and not you have to be the right sort of stubborn. But I do believe what what the challenge for us as researchers is, if you find it fascinating, just think about why you find it fascinating and think about the connections to other people. And, you know, unless you're a sociopath, I suppose, you're going to see it, which I'm not suggesting anyone here is. But, you know, you're going to see those connections, aren't you? You're going to you're going to want to share. We all have topics that once we're on them, it's people find a bit hard to stop us because we just love them. You just find that and have a bit of confidence. And this is, can I go back to Sharknado? So the reason I brought up Sharknado is I use this when I teach that there's this mechanical thing about what you have to do is you have to find a gap in the literature. And I read theses that say, I have found this gap in the literature and I have filled it. Therefore, I've written a thesis. Well, it might not be worth filling. Now, the point is that somebody one day woke up and said, there's movies on sharks. There's movies on tornadoes. No one's filled the gap of putting the two together. Now, you know, depending on your view about movies, that was or wasn't an inspired decision. But I do think that just in, just pursuing a gap in that mechanistic way, you have to think why it matters. That's far more important. What do I have to say to people that matters? Then you go and say, is anyone else saying it? How am I saying it differently? How can I add to them? You have to be courteous. So when I wrote my authentic assessment paper, there are other people using this term there are people who've done brilliant work like Kay Sample and Sally Brown, very practical work. I was offering something different, but I had to position it as complementary and respect them and see myself as adding, not coming in as the great challenger to say, you've all got it wrong for all these years and I've got it right. Nobody will listen to you. So, um, but you have to do find that little bit of confidence and don't be afraid to be Henrietta. Don't be afraid to be a, a sort of odd bird. And she's very odd, to be honest. She's as daft as can be. But, you know, you're that odd bird. And that's sometimes, you know, when I have talks, people introduce me as, here's Jan MacArthur. She's known for thinking things a bit differently. So effectively, they're just calling me an odd old bird. But, you know, that's okay. Um, that's how I've chosen to position myself. Very much. Thank you. That's a really nice answer. Though. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, We've got a question in the chat. Um, what do you think will change in the field of assessment now with AI entering education? <laughs> oh, um, initially, nothing will change. You'll get a whole lot of people running around like headless chooks saying, we've got a crisis. I know Turnitin can sell us a really expensive solution, even though we know it doesn't work. That's what's going to happen initially. What I'd like to happen is for people to go back. So I'd be, I'm asked to give talks on AI and assessment, and I don't talk about AI much at all, because I say the only way forward here is to go back and understand why we assess, to think about that, have our foundations in that. Then we know what we're doing when we come to say, is AI helpful or not helpful? How can it be used? The big other than AI, I think the next big thing in assessment is has to be ungrading because I think grades make no sense logically. Um, and I'm hoping I get accepted to talk at the Manchester conference, Sue, where I'm going to talk about just that, but I might not get accepted because it's just me ranting on. But um, so I think that other than AI, that's the next big thing. I think people are approaching AI the wrong way. They're approaching it as a distraction. Um, and, you know, and again, why are universities paying turn it in when they know it doesn't work? It's just awful. And I've seen a lot of terrible conversations about AI and assessment. 
Um, so there's something coming out soon, actually, where I'm one of the people interviewed. And it's I've read it today and it gives all these views. And then it said, for an alternative view, Jan MacArthur isn't so sure about that. And the whole thing is Jan MacArthur doesn't agree with that. But I am. Um, yeah, that's that's my view on it. It's a good question, though, Svetlanka. We, we've got to not let this just slip. We've got to take control as good people who care about education. Um, we've got to take some control here. We've got a comment from Phil. Um, Phil, do you want to just come to the mic and speak? Yeah, I've been I've been trying to think through um, what the consequences of uh, AI might be, and one of the things that it strikes me is is we have a pretense in HE, um, or at least my perception is we have a pretense um, that we know what we're doing. Um, and that may be the case in groups like us in terms of reading the literature and thinking these things through. But um, actually, when I'm supporting departments and at the coalface, I'm not as convinced that there's um, that we're being honest about what we're doing uh, as a sector. Um, and I think AI is really highlighting a lot of things you know the, the fact that um uh, these so-called ais can actually write stuff that get through the the assessment net brings into question what on earth we're doing with assessment if an ai can do that then what are we doing um th things like that and all the strategies in terms of trying to address that um seem to be uh hiding from the from the truth of that um uh which has me bothered i'm hoping that ai will just get better and keep pushing and pushing until people finally admit that actually they don't know what they're doing with assessment and they need help so that's my that's my challenging <laughs> statement <laughs> i i agree given how important assessment is and given it, ma it makes me a bit angry, actually. And given how many years of assessment scholarship we've had, I mean, Di Hounsel going way back to the 1970s, and people haven't changed. And actually, when when Gen AI first came out in those first couple of months, I was in a meeting of sort of teaching people at the university, and everyone wanted to talk about this in assessment. And I got really angry, and I don't often get angry in meetings. I like to, I want to. And I just said, look, I'm sorry, I'm absolutely fed up with a lot of you. I've been talking for 10 years about the fact that we need to rethink assessment, and you didn't want to engage. And now a computer's telling you to engage, and you want to. I said, this is just rubbish. You should have been engaging long ago. Um, yes, yeah, so I, we've got such a long way to go with assessment. And a lot of the time we're going through the motions. And I'm reminded of this story Philip Dawson tells about a case where, and because also when we're not honest about assessment, suddenly there's a moral panic over AI, but we never got ourselves working to really do anything about contract cheating. And we knew it was going on all the time. So it's not new that we've got essays that weren't written by the person who said they wrote them. We know that people cheat in exams. But we want to pretend they don't, because if we give up that pretense, we're in a whole lot of difficulty. And and then the other thing. So he has this story about a student puts in a, an essay that they didn't write, the contract cheater. You have an over overworked academic who can pay to get someone else to do their marking. So the assessment has neither has not been touched by either of the central parties. And when you say that about at the ground, we don't know what we're doing. I reckon that's happening a lot of the time. I'm, 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 it's quite, and it's a bit weird to reflect on the fact, how come we have all these doctors and lawyers and engineers who seem to be sort of doing what they're doing, and yet there's something wrong in the system at the same time, and it's slightly worrying, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm all with you. And the honesty, honesty was one of my five big points when I wrote that book, that we are not honest about our assessment systems. And that's why I think our grading is so important. Because most of the problems we have with our students are around 
us pretending that we can differentiate grades. Yeah. And we know we can't. The research is very clear we can't. And yet we keep doing it, which is dishonest. Um, and I know Vicky here, Vicky's been a real leader in ungrading, um, Vicky Hill, who's also a Lancaster PhD student. But she was clever before she came to us. Um, so, Philippe, you've got your hand up as well. Do you want to ask a question as well? Yeah, I I want to take advantage. Uh, Jan is my supervisor, so I can ask these questions privately, but I wanted to ask them publicly now because I think I haven't asked this question before, Jan. Um, you were talking about uh, being famous and being invited to stuff. And earlier this week, I for some for some reason, I got into LinkedIn and started seeing a lot of people engaging in a very heated discussion about something that I don't remember at this point. I think it was about coaching or whatever. I don't know. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I know it's slightly off topic, but I wanted to ask you, Jan, in your position now, um, what do you think about us academics engaging in public forums such as X now or LinkedIn or whatever like that? Um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it up to you. What do, what do you think? OK, so um, I'm not I'm not sure I'm famous, but but the thing is, yeah, I'm you know, I'm I'm head of a I'm head of the world's greatest department of educational research. So I suppose there's a certain fame in that. And I think I do engage a lot on social media and I'm probably a little bit reckless in that I just try and be a human being because I think we have to keep doing that. Um, obviously, I don't go on about my private life, or, you know, apart from, you know, that of my chickens. But, um, you know, I think you have to be. And I think there's this thing of, you know, where you where you know you have privilege, you have to use it for good. So I was just on and somebody, Kay Sidebottom was a PhD student with us. Somehow she has something on her thing where somebody said, asking for a friend, is it normal for a PhD supervisor not to say well done after your viva? And I thought, oh, that poor person, you know, clearly something's happened there. So I go on. They don't know me. They probably don't care, but maybe maybe it will help. I said, please tell your friend, well done from me. That's a great achievement. And sometimes these things help. And I think sometimes the kindness of strangers means a lot to people in this disconnected world. And social media lets you do that. I know there's a lot about the unkindness of strangers on it. But maybe I'm lucky in the little world bubble I, I live in on, on on Twitter, you know, which is full of Puyin and, and Sue and people, you know, their sorts of forums. I think it's worth doing um, and I think it's worth doing in a kindly way. And I love the fact that you could say something kind to a stranger where you probably just wouldn't do it in the stop in the street, you know, but maybe we should. But the other thing, if you wanted to be practical about your career, Twitter does help promote readership of journal articles. It really does. Maybe it's going to stop. I don't know. Katie and I had a good talk about this the other day. Katie Jordan from our department, you know, about whether, you know, the, the talk of the demise of X has been a bit premature. But from a sense of building a community, look what Puyin and John have done with the Tao researchers. A lot of that's been on social media, hasn't it? That's how I know. I'm in the department, but I only know about what you do thanks to Twitter. So, but obviously, Philippe, people have to do it with caution. And if people are wanting to research using it, they have to do it with a lot of caution and good advice and, and things like that. And I, I actually think it's important that to, to demonstrate that you stay human in certain roles because we're forced out of them often. You're forced, oh, no, but now your management, you have to do this. You have to be this. You have to be cautious. You shouldn't hug your staff because they might do a complaint. You shouldn't hug your PhD students because that's, and I know, of course, there are situations where it's improper, but a lot of hugging goes on in our department, doesn't it, Philippe? You know, and okay, we're, I think it's a better place for it. So there's that sort of caution. And I think that's important because, you know, when you think about I mean, Paul Ashman is one of the greatest scholars in his field in the world. And yet there he is. He's supervising. He's, he, what you said about him online was just beautiful about the courtesy that he showed 
And, you know, it gets back to that idea of one of the things I think our department's tried to do is to democratise PhDs. They're not just for clever, clever people. They're for, you know, there is no such thing. They're for people who are excited about knowledge and scholarship and want to make a contribution. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, to do it in that spirit. And look at the results we get. Look at how our, our students publish. It's massive the results we get from an approach of treating people nicely in an intellectually challenging environment. Now, I want to ask you an Adorno question, but yeah, go on. Um, favorite uh, text by Adorno? That's a dumb. I'm not. That's such a lame interview question, but I just want you to say something about Adorno. I like Adorno. Well, I go back to Minima Morale a lot. That was, for people who don't know, that's a little book of little aphorisms um, and and they're, they're really interesting to read. But I suppose my must read is, is um, I said criti Critical Models. Um, it's got two titles, Critical Models, and it's got a series of essays. It's got the essay on theory and practice. Um, and that's, there's a lot in that that I really, really like. You know, there's the more obvious ones, but but that probably would be a sort of a favourite. Um, I also really enjoyed reading his letters, letters to Thomas Mann and to different people. And and it's really interesting that the, 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 the essay in it on theory and practice was meant to be a lecture. And this was when Adorno was famously protested against by students in the 60s. And so he never gave the lecture. And they were protesting because they said he was all theory, not practice. And his whole, this if you read this, it's about the interrelationship between theory and practice. And he's saying, I can't do practice. Well, he said in other places too, you can't do practice without thought and you can't do thought without doing. And, and that was his, and also he felt that this sense of him being forced to act was it was itself a form of oppression that reminded him of earlier times. So, you know, this idea of this, you know, it's a real social justice issue. Should we force people to do something just because we think it's the right thing? Um, so I've got a, quite a lot of sympathy for Adorno at that time. But quite apart from that, I really like that book, Critical Models. I think it's time to amuse yourself, show our appreciation to, um, to the great author Joe MacArthur. Or put in the chat or whichever way you want to show it. Thanks for coming. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> it was really lovely to see you all.